Good afternoon. I'm Gene Bottoms uh, with the Southern Regional Education Board. Uh, a lot of you Baptists got here early and got the seat right on the aisle. And if I can convince you all to move in, we have several other folks looking for seats. There are plenty of seats, but you're just going to have to have some closeness together. So uh, uh, they're either going to walk over you or you'll have to move in. So let me urge you to kind of move in if you can and create some aisle seats. Thank you. Who said Baptists were contrary they wouldn't move? I like that. You are moving. Uh, we have a few more folks being set down. We're going to give you just about one minute to find your seat. Then we're going to get started uh, here in just a moment. Because the next event, we're going to need the aisles cleared as you find your seat to set down. There's some seats on the front row over here, about six prime seats right down here on the front row. About uh, seven, eight seats over here on the left in one spot, whole covey of them. One of the mottos of the summer conference, we start on time, we end on time. So uh, please stand as we have the presentation of the flag ceremony by the ROTC from Spring Hill High School in Tennessee. And please remain standing after the presentation of the flag as the four sisters of the Red Head Express sang the national anthem. Oh, say can you see by the dawn's early light what so proudly we hailed at the twilight's last gleaming, whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight or the ramparts we watched were so gallantly streaming and the rockets red thankful for the group from Spring Hill and for the young ladies on the Redhead Express. Good afternoon. You can have your seat now. I want to convey to each and every one of you a warm welcome to Nashville and the second annual College and Career Readiness Standards Networking Conference. By your presence at this conference, you're reaffirming your commitment to master those strategies and tools that result in more of our students graduating high school, more students leaving the middle grades performing at grade level standards, and more leaving high school, college, and career ready. 
Let me recognize, and I'll ask the stand as I call the 10 top states in attendance at this year's networking conference. The number one state is Arkansas with 130. Georgia is number two, 120. In registration here. Kentucky is number three, 118. And the Buckeye State from Ohio, 88. North Carolina, 84, the Tar Heel State. Tennessee, 79. Louisiana, 77. Alabama, 62. And West Virginia with 54. And number 10 is South Carolina with 52. And we're pleased with all the others of you who did not make the top 10 for being here. We have somewhere between 1,100 and 1,200 folks who have registered for this networking conference. Over the next few days, you will learn innovative, proven strategies to get students literacy and math ready for college and careers. In the breakout sessions, you will delve deeply into the literature design collaborative and the math design collaborative and provide an essential foundation for rigorous instruction, strategies that will help improve how teachers teach and students learn. I encourage you to please check out pages 10 and 11 of your conference program. Among other useful information, you will find how to submit conference evaluation and how to access SREB social media services. Now, it is my pleasure to introduce to you SREB's president, Dave Spence. He will give the official welcome to this second annual networking conference, and Dave will introduce our special guest. Dave initially joined SREB as a research associate in the late 70s. He then served as the executive director of the Florida Post Secondary Education Planning Commission, returning to SREB in the mid 80s, leaving again in the late 80s and uh, returning to us in 2005 as our president. Dave has been the vice chancellor of three of the nation's largest higher education systems, Georgia, Florida, and California. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Dave Spence. Dave. Thank you, Dave. Thank you very much, Gene, and welcome to everybody here this afternoon. What a great sight, a uh, 1,000 plus uh, teachers, Thank you for being here, and I know you teachers are the key to higher student achievement. SREB has always promoted high standards that rise to the level of students being college and career ready, such as the Common Core state standards. But we also know that while high standards are absolutely needed, they will not automatically lead to higher student achievement without effective teachers. We need both, and SREB has a strong role in both standards and promoting and providing strong teacher development and preparation. And we are fortunate and grateful to the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation for supporting our work in these two areas, high college and career ready standards and teacher effectiveness. This conference is supported by the Gates Foundation and moreover is based on the teaching tools that uh, were developed by Gates experts, uh, some of whom I see uh, in the room today through their literacy and math design collaboratives. We are proud of our partnership with the foundation and I would like to recognize just a couple of people who are with us from the foundation in addition to Melinda Gates, the co-chair of the foundation, and Vicki Phillips, director of education, both of whom you'll hear from in a few minutes. Uh, we have Alan Golston, who's president of education of the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, and also Sue Desmond Hellman, who's CEO of the foundation. And will you please stand? And there are a number 
And there are a number of their foundation colleagues here as well. And I just want to thank all of you for all that you do to support SREB and the teachers in this uh, region. Uh, SREB has always had a strong presence in working with states to develop statewide policies that will assist schools, districts, and teachers in helping students be college and career ready. These policies may be state board policy or legislative guidelines and can include standards, assessments, teacher development, school accountability, and other areas. We have been so fortunate at SREB to have a strong group of board members, legislative advisory council members, and state school officers in the region who guide SREB's educational improvement efforts and do so, and this is so important, in a fully nonpartisan way. They sincerely try to do what's best for students and teachers. I'd like to just briefly introduce a few who are with us this afternoon, if you'd stand. I'll start with our Vice Chairman, Joe Pickens, uh, former Florida legislative leader and now president of St. John's River College in Florida. Our treasurer is Senator Bob Plymel here. He will be uh, shortly. He's our treasurer. He is the chair of the Senate Education Committee in West Virginia. Senator Francis Thompson of Louisiana has been with SREB since 1978. Thank you, Francis. Uh, Senator Terry Burton of Mississippi, where's Terry? Uh, Senator Paul Pinsky of Maryland, chair of the Senate Education Committee, thank you Paul. Senator Dolores Gresham, chair of the Senate Education Committee in Tennessee. Next to her, Representative Harry Brooks of Tennessee, chair of the House Education Committee. Dr. Johnny Roebuck, former majority leader, in the Arkansas House of Representatives, and two members of SRAB who lead statewide, uh, statewide educational advocacy organizations in their states. Carolyn Novak of Alabama, where she heads uh, A-plus educational partnerships. I got that right, Carolyn. And Rob uh, Resigno in, uh, from Delaware, who is one of the founders of Delaware's Vision 2015. And I want to thank all these SRAB leaders for being here and for their commitment. And thank you very much. And this region and SRAB has always been fortunate to have very effective chief state school officers and board people. Six of them are with us today. From Tennessee is Commissioner Kevin Huffman. Thank you, Kevin, for being here. And also from Tennessee is Gary Nixon, Executive Director of the Tennessee State Board of Education and a longtime participant in SREB work. And we all recognize Tennessee's uh, leadership over the past recent years in educational improvement. Great job. Uh, Commissioner Terry Holliday is here from Kentucky, another state that's a pace setter in educational progress. From South Carolina, State Superintendent uh, Dr. Mick Zace. Thank you, Mick. He's an SREB board member. Dr. Kerry Wright is the state superintendent from Mississippi. And Dr. Jim Ferris from West Virginia, the state uh, school superintendent uh, there. Thank you for being here. Uh, now I want to introduce Danielle Brewer. Danielle Brewer is one of the first teachers from the state of Arkansas to receive training in the Literacy Design Collaborative developed by the Gates Foundation. Today she is one of our top trainers. Danielle, will you come and share your story with all of us as a way of introducing our special speaker and Vicki Phillips. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. By preparation, I am a business teacher. I taught computer applications, business law, and accounting using tried and true instructional practices at Rogers Heritage High School in Arkansas. But in 2011, my world and that of my students changed. 
I encountered trainers and coaches from SREB who introduced me to the Literacy Design Collaborative. The strategies of LDC shifted me from a teacher-centered instructor to a student-centered one. For me and for others, the strategies of LDC have broken the test prep approach to improving achievement. Teachers are discovering that engaging students in meaningful learning, as opposed to just covering materials, really gets more students college and career ready. Developing my first module was a struggle. I don't want to say that it was easy, uh, but it was a productive one. It took an enormous amount of time planning, and at times I thought I was never going to get through the process, but the results I saw in my students left me in awe. They had become independent learners, and I quickly realized that I needed to spend a lot more time in the planning and development of activities and assignments that got students engaged in reading, collaborating with others, and organizing their thoughts into their own written products. As SREB worked with me to improve my second module, the third and fourth did become much easier. The continued work by my LDC team at Arkansas really revitalized the culture of all of our classrooms and of our school. I became a better teacher and LDC allowed me to become a leader of other teachers in my building as I was able to model those effective LDC tools and strategies in my classroom. Then my husband relocated us to Auburn, Alabama. Um, I was fortunate enough to receive a phone call early one morning from SREV. Uh, the caller wanted to know if I was interested in becoming an LDC trainer. I was really hesitant at first because honestly I didn't think I had enough experience. But the caller assured me that I would receive plenty of training before going solo. Those months of training were quite a journey. I not only got to develop more modules, but I visited some amazing classrooms. I got to assist in training sessions, and I was also critiqued by my peers. I scored student writing samples, I vetted modules, and provided feedback to teachers. They eventually let me go solo, and I've enjoyed my work tremendously ever since. As a trainer, I see teachers across the country using the tools to engage students in complex assignments that before they would not have assigned. These LDC teachers are using teaching tasks that engage students in rigorous content through reading complex texts and writing for authentic purposes. Their students have taken more interest in their learning and are taking pride in their work. My experiences as a trainer and a, and a teacher have been profoundly rewarding. I want to thank the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation for having the confidence in teachers and investing in the tools that just make sense. Teachers are discovering how to design assignments that make students owners of their work. The result is higher student achievement in reading, writing, and in con and content area standards. On behalf of all teachers, I offer you our sincere thanks. We are delighted to have Melinda Gates with us here today, and we are eager to hear what she has to say. First, we will have the pleasure of hearing from Melinda Gates. She will then be joined in a Q&A session with Vicki Phillips, Director of College Ready at the Gates Foundation. Now, Please join me in giving Melinda Gates a warm welcome. Thank you. Thank you for that warm welcome. Um, honestly, I have to say, it doesn't feel like that long ago where I used to be nervous to stand up and speak in front of one teacher. 
So to be here in front of all of you, um, I was asked to speak at my high school graduation, and I remember the teacher who was so instrumental to me then, because I went crying back to my drama teacher who taught me actually for six years, and I said, I never wanted to speak at my high school graduation. And she said something like, I think this is gonna be good preparation down the road. And little did she know. <laughs> um, I wanna thank Danielle for sharing her story about how much this work has meant to her over the years in her career. I wanna thank Jean Bottoms and Dave Spence for giving me the opportunity to speak with all of you today. You know, for 60 years, the Southern Regional Education Board has really known that the country's road to prosperity goes straight through our schoolhouses. And when I think about the influence that you all have had in the Southern region through so many classrooms and through projects like Schools That Work or the Go Alliance, it's really because you understand that quality education happens because of that interaction that happens between teachers and students. When I think about the influence that you've had at the State House and with governors across the nation, it's again because they know that they can come to you for very sound, nonpartisan advice about the very best policies and programs that are gonna change our classrooms across the country. When we think about gains in student achievement, it's a testament, your work, to what really works. And so, as a foundation, we're proud to say that we're in partnership with you, but the truth is that we rely on you. Our goal is to make sure that every child in this country is college ready. And we can only do that with the work and through the work of the amazing partnership like the one with SREB. I'm gonna keep this afternoon my remarks rather brief because I wanna make sure that we get time to move on to Q&A. But I wanna say a few things so that you understand how Bill and I and our foundation approach this education work. So you understand a little bit about who we are and why we do this work. As a parent, I care deeply about education. But I've also been learning formally about education across the country for the last 20 years since we've gone after education reform. Bill and I decided over 20 years ago that the most important thing we thought our foundation could do for the country was to make sure that every single student had the chance to achieve their dream. And over the last 20 years, that's meant that I've had to visit schools, and it's really been a privilege to go to schools across the country, whether it's in Boston, or it's in Oakland, or it's in Tampa, or it's in Denver, or it's in Vail. We are out and about in schools because that's the only way to see what's really going on and where the possibilities are and where great teaching is happening and the difference that it makes. And the thing that makes me the most optimistic about education in the United States is when I talk to the teachers and the students. So depending on how old you are, you might remember the movie To Sir With Love, or if you're like me, Stand and Deliver, or perhaps Dangerous Minds. And what those movies portray, I think, about education is the heroism with which you all do your work. It's the job description, really, of millions of teachers who go to work every day in this country. You face obstacles, you work like crazy to overcome those obstacles, sometimes to just push straight through them. And Lord knows you go, don't get enough prestige or money for the jobs that you do. But what I see when I meet with teachers is the passion that they bring to their work because they know they're changing the life of a student. My heroine in teaching was a high school teacher of mine named Mrs. Bauer. She was not only my teacher, she was a single mom with three boys at home, and she was getting her PhD in computer science at night. And she went to a conference. And at that conference, much like the conference program here, they had a small track about getting computers in school, and she attended it. She came back from that conference, and she said to the principal of my school, we have to get eight computers for my classroom so that I can teach these girls, this all-girls school, how to program on computers. She believed in me and my classmates. She believed that girls could be good in math and computer science. And I don't think it's an understatement to say she changed the trajectory of my life. 
I never would have gone on to study computer science in, high, in college, never would have gone to Microsoft, nor met my husband, nor be doing the work that I'm doing today. So when I first started our work in education, I was particularly interested, quite honestly, in girls and computers, because I thought if you could get these tools into, into kids' hands, you could really change what they could do. And so at the foundation, we started looking at the different factors that determine what make the biggest difference for the biggest number of students. And it came pretty quickly to realize that the computer was not the thing that made the difference. The all, research all points in exactly one direction, that the best thing you can do to help a student succeed is to put an effective teacher at the front of the classroom. It was the way Mrs. Bauer was teaching us. It was not the computers themselves. And she was one of those great teachers that found that spark in us, and she wasn't afraid to let us get out ahead of her sometimes. And we were all learning and collaborating together. So that's what our foundation is committed to doing, is to empowering and supporting and partnering with great teachers across the country. That's what we're about. So when I think about teachers as partners, not just in their professional lives, but I also think about teachers in our own personal lives. Some of you may not know that Bill and I have three children. And again, one of the best things we get to do at the start of the academic year is to sit down with their teachers and talk about that we're partners in educating our children. Partnerships with the teachers, whether it's social, emotional, or intellectual development. And that sense of being your partner is the attitude we bring to the work of the foundation as well. We want you to know that we're on your team. We know that effective teaching isn't the only thing that students need to succeed, but when it comes to what happens inside of schools, teaching is the most important thing, and teachers are the ones who know how to teach the very best. So for us, the very first step in this is listening. When I talk to teachers, there are two things I hear over and over and over again. First, teachers tell us that they feel cut off from their professional community. They don't have enough opportunities to work with their colleagues and to have time to collaborate. So I was excited when I heard that SREB has these 120 teacher pairings that are going on at this conference. But that is really unusual. You don't see that happening all over the country. And in most cases, when teachers want to collaborate with one another, they have to do it on their own time. And so that's the second thing I hear from teachers over and over again. They say to me, time? What time? Where would I get time to do collaboration or to do more professional development? One teacher I met with last year in New York described his day to me. I said, just go through what a day looks like. And he says, well, I get up at 5 a.m., I make myself an egg, I might, I might get a little time for exercise. Then I zip off to try and catch the subway to school and I begin teaching. And I start teaching at eight o'clock in the morning and when the last bell rings, I start working with my kids to support them after school with this extra supports they need and on their homework. And he said, then I make sure I run and catch the subway home. I might get a little time to collaborate on Pinterest or another online tool if I'm lucky over dinner. I grade papers. And basically, I go to bed and I start my day again. I could not believe the stress that these teachers were under. And in fact, when we got this small group of teachers together in New York, I was amazed to hear them talk to one another and the younger teachers who were only two years into their careers saying to the ones who were five or six years in your career, when do you cross the hump? How do you ever find enough time? So at the Gates Foundation, we're also working on innovative professional development. How do you find time in that incredibly busy school day to parse out time for real professional development, real coaching, and online, and, and sorry, and personalized professional development that is meaningful that you can use in the classroom the next day and get feedback on it that day for your next day's lesson? Finding time in the schedule, we're working with communities like Bridgeport, Connecticut, and also Fresno, California, to start looking at the school week and figuring out new ways to do professional development within the school schedule. So what we see with teachers is that you all put in a superhuman effort. 
And you deserve a system, though, that works better for all of you and for our students. We need a system that works better for everybody, teachers and students. So that brings me to the Common Core. At our foundation, we've been strong supporters of the Common Core state standards because we believe they can help you solve some of the problems you've identified as your biggest challenges. We continue to support the standards because you've told us that you think they're helping you teach in new and richer ways, just the ways that Danielle described up here on stage earlier. But ultimately, we think about standards actually as flexibility. And people are surprised sometimes when we use the word flexibility in standards in the same sentence. And I think people sometimes worry that standards are going to have the opposite effect. And it doesn't help, I don't think, this whole conversation that the word standard itself can be a bit of a confusing term. But standards to us are just a platform on top of which you can do all kinds of customization and all kinds of innovation. And the real key to this is that the standards are not a curriculum. Not, they were never meant to be a curriculum. They aren't textbooks. They aren't teachers' individual style. Standards only say what the students need to learn. They're not telling teachers how to teach the standards. So let me just give you an illustration about some of the common uh, state standards, a common core standard for high school, in, for instance, for high school geometry. This is this, one of the standards. Prove theorems about lines and angles. That's it. That's the standard. So if you're a geometry teacher, you know that you have, this is something students have to learn. But it doesn't matter how you teach that. There are lots of ways to get at that standard. Or take the ninth grade reading standard. This is one of the standards. Analyze how complex characters develop over the course of a text, how those characters interact with other characters, and advance the plot or they develop the theme. So you could get at that standard in a whole number of ways. You could teach the Scarlet Letter. You could teach the Secret Life of Bees. You could use it teaching the book The Beloved. You get to decide. Your classroom could decide they want to perform a play around that standard. Or they could write a paper. Or they could do group work. It's based on the teacher's experience, what they want in the classroom, and their best judgment of how to make sure that the students actually learn that standard. So since the standards are consistent, you can plug in to a professional community then that stretches all the way from Florida to Washington State and begin to share ideas and lesson plans with colleagues who, professionally speaking, used to speak, quite honestly, a different language than, than you in your classrooms. Now, I know that there's real concern, for very good reason, about teacher evaluation systems that are being put in place at the same time the Common Core is being put in place. Many people, for very good reason, worry about the consequences that are going to begin to kick in and before teachers and students feel like they're ready to adjust to the new standards and that they need time to get used to the standards. And I share this concern. The point of the standards is to make sure students are learning what they need to know to succeed in life and in college. The point of teacher evaluations is to help making sure that teachers are getting better and better year after year in their craft of teaching. So when an evaluation system is done well, that's exactly what the evaluation system can do alongside the Common Core. We've been doing work in districts, including two in the South for quite some time, Tampa and Memphis, to improve teacher evaluation. And we recently surveyed the teachers in those districts, and I'm really incredibly proud of the results that we heard. 70% of the teachers in those districts say that the evaluations have made them more thoughtful about their teaching and more likely to talk to colleagues about their work. 75% of the teachers said that the evaluations helped them pinpoint very specific areas for them to improve. And 80% of the teachers say that the process motivated them to make changes in the way that they teach. So if there are places where teachers are feeling penalized instead of supported, then those evaluation systems need to be adjusted 
because they're not working. It's just that simple. And that's how we think about the Common Core. Does it help teachers do their work? From the way people, some people talk about Common Core, you'd think that implementation is taking place these days on cable news. But while everybody else is talking about these standards, you're doing the hard work of learning how to make the Common Core standards work for your kids and your students. So even the best ideas aren't self-fulfilling. Standards are just words on a page until you all start to breathe life into them and to use them in the classrooms in ways that are effective for students' learning. We're proud to be a partner in this cause, and I want to get to questions, so let me just say one last thing. I really want you to know that the foundation is in this for the long term. This is our life's work in the US system is education. We want to be a partner that you can count on, that you know that we're listening, that you know that we're trying to improve the system because it's right for students, but we're trying to time it right to do it so it works well for teachers to teach their very best and be their most effective in front of the classroom. So when you step into the classroom this fall, know that we're behind you all the way and I want to thank you for all that you've done already and all that you're doing today. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. So Melinda, we get to talk to teachers across the country a lot, our team does, and you see a lot of teachers yourselves. So this afternoon I wanted to ask you a number of questions that we often hear from teachers or, or we see you, you get in smaller groups. You mentioned in um, the speech your passion and why you and Bill came into education in the first place, but will you say a little more about why you got involved and more, perhaps more importantly, why you stay involved? Well, I think fundamentally it comes down to, first of all, that Bill and I believe that all lives have equal value. So no matter where you're born, Boston or Bangladesh or Nairobi, that all lives have equal value. And that's the premise of the foundation. But when we started to think about where we wanted to invest in the United States, we both felt so incredibly lucky that we had a great education. And as we started to learn more about the US education system and think about how much we cared about our democracy, we realized that all kids weren't getting that chance. And we just, we, we just, in some ways, couldn't believe that that was the case. So we started originally giving scholarships so that students could get into college, but we realized that wasn't enough, that the students, so many students weren't even prepared to go to college. And we said, this is what we want the foundation to be about in the United States. If we believe in equity, we have to work on education in the United States. So, you know, on our side, we're education all the time. But you also deal with global health and global development. How do you hold those disparate things? What do you think they have in common? How do you think about those? So outside the United States, the work that the foundation does is predominantly in the areas of global health and global development. Um, global health meaning that the reason we work in global health outside the United States is, again, if you believe that all lives have equal value, People have to have the chance to grow up and have a healthy life. And so many people in places like Africa or northern India or in Bangladesh, they have these diseases sometimes that we don't even think about in the United States. But if they can't survive or their children can't survive or they can't get the cognitive development for their kids because their kids are malnourished, they don't have the chance to grow up a healthy life. So we work predominantly in the developing world in, in health and then helping people lift themselves up to have some income for a livelihood. But I don't actually think of these agendas as disparate because in the United States, most people in our country have a chance to grow up and have a healthy life. But when they get into the US education system, that's where things fall down for a lot of students. And to us, that's the equity agenda in the United States. So what's your assessment of how it's going? How's, how's K to 12 education in the US working? 
Well, I would say a couple of things, and, and they're kind of on different sides. It's kind of like, to me, the glass is half, half full, basically half empty, half full, which is, you know, to have for the first time ever in the country, you know, Education Week reporting a month ago that the graduation rate is the highest we've ever seen in the country, 81%. That, to me, is the glass half full. My gosh. And again, a decade ago, we weren't even talking about graduation. We were more talking about students coming into high school, how many kids are getting into high school, but we weren't really talking about how many are truly making it through. So to me, that's the glass half full. The glass half empty, though, to be frank, is that you have to look at the students and say, when they come out, are they truly prepared for college? How many are going on into remediation in college and really aren't ready or get into college and they drop out freshman or sophomore year. And so the fact that we still have, you know, a huge chunk of these students, 36% who really, we only have 36% that are ready to go, to me, that's a tragedy. And you're missing, the fact you're almost missing two thirds of the kids being truly ready to go, that's not, that's not near good enough. And so we still have a lot of work to do in the country. So you talked in the speech for a moment about how, just how important teachers are to a student's achievement. And we made a clear decision a few years back to support teachers. Um, talk to the teachers in this audience about why that decision was so important to you. Yeah, I don't think, you, you can't affect the U.S. school system unless it's, it's done by, by the teachers, right? I mean, you all are the ones that are every day in the classroom working with the students. And when I go into classrooms, it's just beyond clear that the teaching is both a science and an art, right? I mean, you're having to draw out that student who doesn't think of himself as very good at math, and that girl who maybe doesn't think of herself as particularly good at a particular piece of math. You've got to draw them both out and keep the classroom together and know that you're moving the students along so that when you graduate them, they're ready to go on and do, you know, algebra in ninth grade or if it's geometry. And so if you don't engage the teachers in the process, we would be doing something to the system instead of the teachers being the ones to say, this is the way to move forward. And I saw, I've seen so much incredible teaching going on across the United States in situations that you can't even believe the teachers are doing such great work. And yet we would hear these dual, many, many problems, these dual problems of, you know, I can't collaborate, I'm siloed in my classroom. That was coming up over and over and over again. I can't, I don't have time, I don't even know where to go. I go out on the internet and even if I wanted some lesson to help me on algebra, I don't even know where to go to find it. Nothing's tagged very well. And so having teachers be the ones that we listen to and help us figure out the way forward because we all have the same goal of graduating these kids and making sure they can succeed, that just makes sense to me. So you mentioned also during the speech um, why we're such strong supporters of the Common Core, or whether you call it the Common Core or the Kentucky Academic Standards, the notion of clear, consistent standards for um, students. Um, let's do a little more myth-busting for okay. this group. Um, what else besides the fact that they form this new opportunity for creativity for teachers and um, the fact that they really hold to the right level for kids. What else would you want this group to, to know that you've seen and that you've heard as you've talked to teachers? Okay, so I hear a lot of things about, as you all do too, about the Common Core. Um, one of the myths that I hear all the time is that Bill created them, which I think is actually very funny. Because uh, I see his whole schedule at the foundation. Well, and as you know, we right. practically share an office. So if he did this in his spare time, I don't know where it happened. Uh, but as you all know, the, the Common Core State Standards were developed by a set of states with lots and lots of input from educators and from state commissioners in education thinking about if we're going to be competitive in today's society, what is it that our students need to know and to learn? And so it's with that backdrop that they were created. The things that I love about the Common Core is, as I mentioned, the flexibility that it gives teachers. Once they understand what it is, teachers go, wow, this, this is what I want. And then it allows for all this innovation to come in around it. So whether it's an online instruction coming in, whether it's Khan Academy tagging all their lessons to the Common Core, whether it's the teaching channel, and so you can go up and, and see a great teaching lesson about algebra or teaching something in literature, and you can collaborate with other teachers. It allows for collaboration to happen in new and different ways and new tools to come in. 
But then it also helps students because the students know they're getting prepared to go to college. The students are actually, when you talk to them, really excited about the rigor. I'll come back to that in a minute. But um, the other thing is that also there are students who move across state lines and the fact that you're going to school in Alabama and then your parents move to Tennessee and you're being held to two different things in eighth or ninth grade, that, that just makes no sense. Um, one of the most fun things I've had happen around the Common Core, just speaking about kind of students and the rigor of this, we were out in the, the Denver and Eagle County, which is Vail, out, outside around Denver. Bill and I were out two years ago in that particular area. And uh, the teachers had already ad adopted the Learning uh, Design Collaborative and the Math uh, Development Collaborative initiatives. And I was talking to students about it, and I was saying, well, are you noticing anything different in the classroom since your teachers have adopted this? And this one student was so sweet, he said, oh, my teacher, Mr. Knight, the English teacher, he is the smartest person I've ever met. And I said, really, why, or you know, what's changed since, because I knew this teacher had taken on the LDC tools. He said, he comes back to my writing, and I'm on the fifth draft of my essay, and he's teaching me how to write. And if you can teach me how to write, you can teach anybody how to write. <laughs> and I thought, that's the difference, right? The kids are seeing the rigor. I mean, this kid was working hard when he described this paper, but this kid was seeing the difference it was making in his own writing, and he was starting to trust himself that he could actually be a writer, and that's the difference behind having rigor in our curriculum. And we all thought that was so fantastic because that student was sitting next to Bill, saying, Mr. Knight is the smartest guy I've ever met. <laughs> <laughs> it was very cool. It was a great trip. So talk a little more, um, Melinda, about the trips. I mean, we feel really fortunate to have co-chairs who actually go out and travel and see the work and meet teachers and students and educators across the country. Why is that so important, and what do you gain from doing that as opposed to sitting in the meetings in Seattle? Yeah, um, so I think one, one of the other things you should just know about the foundation is that we are very internally <laughs> data-driven. I think that's yeah. probably fair to say. Yes. Um, and so we read lots and lots of reports. We meet with lots of people who come to the foundation in all kinds of topics, whether it's science or education, to teach us about the best things going on in the United States or outside the United States. But there is absolutely, you cannot begin to do this work in, in any field that we're in, whether it's in global health or whether it's in education in the United States, you can't do the work unless you go out and see what's actually going on in the ground. Because I don't care how many reports you read about education, until you're in the classroom and seeing the challenge that the, that the teachers are up against, these students, the very first set of student schools I went out to for the very first education trip was a set of schools in Boston and then a set of schools in Oakland. When I went into the Boston schools, the principal was late and he came in, you know, kind of huffing and puffing. He said, I'm really, really sorry I'm late to the meeting. But he was negotiating with the gang members on the corner to get the kids out of the drug deal to get them into school. That's what he was facing the first thing in the morning. And when I talked to the students and I said, you know, what makes a difference in, in your school? Like, what are you seeing the changes are with your teachers? The first thing the kids described to me was their relationship with the teacher. The how much the teacher cared and was working with them even though they knew they were several grade levels behind. When I went to Oakland, I went through a metal detector and there were two cop cars in the front yard of the public school I went to. That was not like the school I went to in Dallas, Texas. But unless you see these schools and you're in and out of them in all these places, Tampa, Memphis, Denver, Philadelphia, in New York City, DC, you, unless you're out, you can't see the trends, to really see the trends, see what teachers are up against, see what great teaching looks like, how it's done in even these tough environments and kids are succeeding. You have to hear from students about what's working and how they really view it. I was in a school in, in Tampa about four years ago and they had just rolled out the teacher evaluation system in the previous two years and the teachers had gone through incredible angst when this evaluation system first came out. I mean, it was really hard on them. But two years in, they were seeing the changes and they were talking about how the coaching was making a huge difference now and they were changing the craft of their teaching. And one of the teachers said, I thought I was a pretty good teacher, but I'm realizing I really wasn't. I'm a way better teacher now. But what the students described was they said, we couldn't wait for the evaluators to come in the back of our classroom because we knew we'd seen our teachers being coached over in the math classroom, but they weren't yet being coached in English, and we knew they needed it. 
And that's, yeah, the kids see this stuff. And so you learn a lot by being out in the schools about what can actually work and then also even how hard it is. And so we even know that, you know, this point of view of you've got to have the common core state standards, you've got to have the evaluation system, but you've got to give it time. We wouldn't have known how much time it took and what it took to overcome, not only the angst, but the two or three years of seeing it in place before it actually works. We wouldn't have known that you need that sort of that time in between if we hadn't been out working so deeply in the schools, I think, this long. Yeah. You've spent a lot of time with uh, kids and teachers, and they're just pretty clear with you uh, consistently about what they're experiencing, and that has truly driven a lot of our work. And one of the lens that you and Bill see the world through, and that is part of our value system at the foundation, is innovation. And you push us a lot to think about how do we innovate on behalf of students and of teachers. So can you just talk a little bit about what you, the role that you see innovation playing? Because I think sometimes people think that when you think innovation, you think computers and technology rather than a larger spectrum. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So I think because we're from the computer industry, it's probably the reason we believe in innovation, right? And that we kind of deeply, it's embedded in our DNA. But when Bill and I think of innovation, we don't just think of the techie stuff. I think what Saul Khan does, you know, online, I think a lot of the online things are fantastic. And I think they're going to be very, very helpful to teachers. But I don't think of that as the only part of innovation. To me, the common core is an innovation. It's an innovation in saying, we know what we need to have as standards so we know kids are going through the grade levels appropriately. But even the, the LDC and the MDC tools, those quite honestly are a huge innovation. When we first were out, again, we were talking about them inside the foundation, Vicki had shown them to us, we were all discussing them, but until I actually saw them out being implemented by teachers and I saw the difference that scaffolding was making for their students and how they would use the support in the scaffolding at different levels for different students and then start to pull it away with the LDC tools and the MDC tools as the, the kids got further along, I didn't even realize what an amazing innovation it was. But then it was the teachers and the students who described the difference in the classroom environment um, that you could see, wow, that was a true innovation. And then I do believe, like I said, in online tools, Saul Khan's work, you know, the teaching channel is fantastic. There are half a million teachers now looking at teaching channel and the neat thing is sometimes when uh, I get group, small groups of teachers together, they will have met one another at a conference and they will have seen one another on the teaching channel or been collaborating online, but then they first come to a conference and this is the first time they're actually meeting face to face, but they continue on that partnership and that learning from each other. So even the ways I'm seeing now teachers using Pinterest to learn about some of the really neat things going on across the country in teaching, I saw a great, uh, a great art teacher who's doing something really neat in New York. She has literally millions of followers now who follow this particular art teacher because of the way she teaches art. But having teachers even uh, collaborate through social media when they're both teaching, for instance, a history lesson in ninth grade and they're learning from one another, those are amazing innovations that I think will just keep pushing. But unless we think about how do you you know, change the craft of teaching so that it is truly excellent in every single classroom and what are the innovations. Unless we think about that and do it, we wouldn't be intentional in that work and we need to be. Well, and you guys both push us on that and often get to see it early on when it's still in its challenging kind of, you know, rough stages. And you had an opportunity to really talk to some of those teachers from Fresno and Bridgeport about actually getting time. Um, what, what are you hoping comes out of that work over the next few years, not just in those two districts, but in others that are starting to think hard about time and more innovative professional development? Yeah, so when you look at the countries that are really doing well on these scores, and you look at the U.S. and where we stand, and we all know the PISA rankings, right? But when you look at what's going on in those countries that are really educating all their children well, a big part of it has to do with the professional development that the teachers are getting, that very specific personalized mentoring and coaching so that they keep uh, being the top of their class, that they keep working on their own professional development. Well, our school system, even though we have professional development, and you all do it in places like this and in the summers, if we don't figure out how to get more time in the schedule during the school day and the school week, you won't get that very specific personalized coaching and mentoring that makes a big difference. So in Bridgeport, 
um, and in Fresno, the things that are exciting there is how they're taking apart the calendar of the week and starting to say, okay, if you could give teachers professional development at the end of the week on Fridays, if we were really in these learning communities and collaboratives, and we had teaching time so that the substitute teacher that comes in and takes over my class on Friday isn't really a substitute teacher. She's, he or she is part of our teaching collaborative, and we're planning lessons for the whole year that go across what we're trying to teach and coach. He or she that takes over the classroom is taking over every single Friday. So the students don't see them as substitutes anymore because they're part of the professional community that's teaching, and they have consistency with the students. Um, the whole way they're taking apart that schedule, then those teachers actually who are leaving, the, let's say, history or English language learning on Friday, they're going out and doing professional development together, as well as the teachers who take over their classrooms are doing professional development throughout the week and are sprinkling in and out of the classroom. So it's everybody surrounding that student, and it frees up time then for the teachers on Fridays where they wouldn't normally have time. That's why one, one way that one of the districts are doing it. And the teachers are seeing a huge difference because they come back to their classroom on Monday morning and they have specific things that they're implementing on Monday morning that were different than when they left their classroom on Thursday. And the kids are noticing it. They're also starting to realize that the, the teachers who come in on Fridays to do the teaching who are part of that professional community need to be some of the very best teachers. You don't put the teacher that kids look at as the substitute teacher, you put the highest quality teachers on Friday so then everybody goes, wow, we're getting great teaching across the whole week. That's some of the innovation. Yeah, which addresses a big fear of teachers that they'll get the time but lose instructional time with students, which, which isn't happening in those districts. It's very powerful. Exactly. So I want to switch gears for just a moment. Um, we have our share of cr uh, critics and criticisms. How do you feel when you're investing so much of your time and energy and, and uh, people critique the investments? Sure. Um, well, first of all, I think criticism is a good thing. I mean, we don't have, at the foundation, it's not like, uh, you know, in the tech space where you're putting out a product and you get immediate feedback. You know whether your product's used or not because your customers either buy it or they don't. In this space, it's really the criticism that helps us think even more deeply about the work. And so we all listen, Vicki and her team, Bill and I, we read a lot of the criticism and we're asking ourselves deeply, okay, does that make sense? Why are we being criticized in that way? What is it that we haven't seen? So some of the criticism I feel like is very legitimate. Some of it is also just politicized because people don't like that the system is being pushed on. But we've got to push the system. I mean, if you aren't preparing every single student ready to go on to college and succeed in life, then we're not doing good enough in terms of, of a community of learners. So in that vein, I don't actually mind the criticism. Yes, we are part, the foundation is part of with teachers trying to push the system and improvement. Um, the one place I think that people don't quite understand us, and again, I hope this will change over time, is just that everything that we're doing in education is a collaboration, and it comes with a lot of listening. I mean, one of the things when Vicki or Alan or anyone on the team comes back from a trip that they're on is one of the first things we say to them, Bill and I, is what did you learn? What, what did you hear? What did you hear from our partners? What did you hear from teachers? What criticisms are you hearing? Where do you think some of this is gaining traction? What have we not seen that we should be doing differently in evaluations? What have we not done? What are we, how are we thinking about professional development? I just heard something great going on in this district. Have you heard about it? So we're all learning together, but I think if, if people understood a little bit more that all of our education work is done in collaboration, um, I think that would just be more beneficial over time. So I'm hoping it gets there. So I want to ask you one last question before Jean comes up and uh, uh, lays out what this group needs to do for the rest of the day. And that is that you and Bill did a speech recently at Stanford, and you talked about another one of our foundation values, which is optimism. And you, this goal that we all have, and everybody in this room shares, and you heard both Jean and Dave speak to it on the stage about this notion of college readiness for everyone, um, making sure that kids exit high school with the skills they need. It's a really ambitious agenda with lots of challenges. What makes you optimistic that it's going to succeed? Yeah, I guess I see so many of the building blocks being laid down and being laid down today in not only thoughtful ways, but in ways that are starting to take hold. So the fact that the Common Core has been laid down, has been signed up to by you know, over 46 states in DC. Yes, a few states have decided they're gonna move away from it, but the funny thing is, even when they've moved away, they've kept state standards that are basically the Common Core. 
it means that building block is absolutely one of the right building blocks. So we have that building block in place. When I see the building block of evaluation systems done and being done well in ways that teachers a couple of years in go, wow, this is making a difference in my teaching and I see the outcomes for my students, that building block is being laid down and being laid down well in places in the country. Yes, there are some places that have gone too fast, gotten the implementation wrong, but I see that happening. When I see that we actually, because of the Common Core, have far more people moving into the education space with all kind of great tools and technology and social media tagged to the Common Core, and there are these new tools, I, I start to say, wow, we're getting the innovative pieces that we'd hoped for with the Common Core. And then when I see just that the um, graduation rates are going up in places like Kentucky and Tampa, and I look at the NEEP scores and I say, wow, Tennessee came up. DC came up. You're starting to see that these building blocks that have laid down, we're starting to actually see the results. And if we were sitting here, I hope we are sitting here on the stage five years from now, I would hope to be able to talk about incredible places that we've seen test scores come up for students where you know we're actually getting all the real learning gains. But it's all those pieces that I see being laid down and teachers supporting them and say, yeah, this is right for my classroom and students saying, I'm, I'm seeing a difference. That's what gives me optimism that we're on the right path as a country. So people often ask me and um, my colleagues, where our deep-seated commitment to teachers and teaching and the kids in this country come from? I think you've seen exactly where it comes from. Bill and Melinda uh, set that bar high for us on an ongoing basis, and we've been honored uh, to be here with you this afternoon. So thank, thank you, you very, very us. much. Thank you, Melinda. Thank you, Vicki, for your insightful remarks. And join me again in expressing our thanks for you coming and being with us. Now, if you'll turn to page five of your program, you will find on page five descriptions of the different types of programs that we have. You'll have programs that will be coded IN. Those are introductory programs for those who do not know anything about the new literacy and math tools. Best practices, BP, will be those sessions where teachers have discovered those best practices that get results. Evidence-based are those sessions in which people have some evidence that using these tools drive up achievement, engage students deeper in a number of ways, the deep dive sessions are designed for you to take back a given practice you could go to put to work in your classroom the first week of school of this year. Planning and scaling, how do you move this from six or eight teachers in a school, school-wide, district-wide, statewide. Technology, how these sessions will be about using technology to enhance this literacy and math work. Then the college and career readiness standards, We'll have uh, SREB has developed a series of college ready and math ready courses for those students who arrive at the end of the 11th grade who plan to go into post-secondary studies, but by all indication will have to take remedial literacy and math courses. These courses are designed to address that problem. Uh, you'll find those being described. If you stay over the high schools at work conference, you'll find more than 100 teachers and 100 different high schools are here being prepared how to teach those courses this coming fall in their schools. On page seven, a special request many of you made last year. You said, we'd like to know if the presenters are from a small school like ours. Are they from a middle sky school like ours? Are they from a very large school? Are they rural? Are they suburbia? Are they urban? So on page seven, you'll see the codes there. So you will know you're, talk, you're going into a session with folks kind of like you. If they can make it work and they're like you, you may want to take those back. Now let me just leave you with a challenge. Many of you came in teams. I hope that uh, you've scanned through the programs. You've decided which team members are going to which programs to collect which idea. Somebody on the team controls the district credit card. Make sure they take you out for dinner both tonight and tomorrow evening. <laughs> Part of that dinner session is to debrief. What did you hear that you could take back 
and put to work in your school this fall. As you collect those up over the years of this summer networking conference, we've had schools to attend a session similar to this a couple of years ago. They literally went back with the literacy and math tools and they have seen tremendous jumps in their achievement. Great leaders can take these tools and use them. So let me urge you as teams, network together. Five or six folks going back to school with a passion and burn can turn a school around. So I, I challenge you in that regard. So the, our great continental breakfast will be between seven and eight in the morning. We will start the sessions on time. The continental breakfast will be in the Tennessee ballroom. Lunch, one round of lunch will be from 11.45 to 12.45. We're running programs throughout the day because we have over 200 sessions here, teachers, leaders going on stage. Stays from Alabama through North Carolina get to go the first shift. Ohio and West, Ohio through West Virginia will go through the second shift, 1 to 2 p.m. And uh, now I know I can't control all of that, but some of you may get there in their long line, so it'll balance out better if you'll kind of follow this pattern. Our first session will begin now in 15 minutes at 2.15. So go have a great conference, do good, and network together. Go forward. <laughs>